Welcome back to Breaking Monero. Today we are covering a sensitive topic, chain splits. Chain splits are a really complex topic to cover. In fact, it's one of the real main motivators for having these Breaking Monero episodes. But to give a brief key takeaway, if you get nothing else, the best thing you can do is to not claim forks. And if you do, realize that you're sort of playing with fire and you can easily screw up with many, many consequences. So. Again, if something's seeming too complicated, just go back to that main point and we can proceed from there. But uh, I would like to initially um, talk about initially how this topic is really tricky to talk about because you can not only just easily screw yourself over if you do something wrong, but you can also contribute to reduce security and privacy for others through the sort of chain split, uh, so chain reaction scenario we described during the last episode. So see that if you're skipping to this one. But first, let's hand it over to Sarang, who is going to talk about what key images are and other introductions about sort of hard forks and chain splits. Sure, thanks. Uh, so it's good to have everybody back. So in the previous episodes, we talked a little bit about kind of the uh, how the structure of Monero's transactions, where the sending uh, elements of the transaction are included in a so-called ring, um, has some consequences for things like zero mix-ins and for chain reactions. And one thing that I want to emphasize about the way that transactions are structured with rings, it's going to be very, very relevant here, is something that we call a key image, or it might be called a tag in some versions of the literature. Um, and the important thing to remember with that is if I have, for example, as Monero does now, a ring containing 11 you know, one-time use keys, and I'm spending one of those, well, I want to make sure that I can't use one of those keys in a future transaction and double spend. Remember, a given one-time key might appear in many different rings, but it can only be spent one time. So every transaction has uh, what well, you can kind of think of as like a one-way representation of the actual spending one-time key called the key image associated to it. It's important to note that you cannot look at a transaction, look at its key image, which is completely out there and, and publicly posted, and determine from that which of the ring members was used. However, if the person uh, who made that transaction attempts to spend the same, you know, a priori unknown one-time key in a later transaction, they will share the same key image. Um, the signature construction makes sure that when you're doing this, you can't lie about how you constructed the key image mathematically. So it is an effective double spend protection. If you look at two transactions and if they have the same key image, then you know that the exact same um, one-time ring input was used as the sender in that. Although you ideally should not be able to determine which it is. So this will become relevant when we're talking about this. Um, I know that Justin, you wanted us to talk a little bit about the different kinds of forks, since that's a word that appears sometimes. Absolutely. Um, so there's so different ways you can look at the word fork. Um, it's important to note that just kind of in the natural mining process of the network, we occasionally do get small forks, since mine, different miners might find different blocks at around the same time. Um, but eventually, those small forks end up going away, and that's what we uh, end up meaning when we find consensus among you know, a longest chain, for example. So at the end of the day, even though we have many small forks in the network naturally, they're very, very short-lived typically. It's also worth noting that we do regular network upgrades to the Monero system. Um, these are sometimes called hard forks, but I prefer the term network upgrade. So technically, we are forking away from an old chain to a new chain. But in general, these are non-contentious. Everyone follows the new chain, and it's not a big deal. So nothing to worry about there. There's also the idea of what's called a code fork. We're an open source project. You can go on GitHub and look at the Monero source code. You are free to do what's called a code fork and basically take that code, modify it, and start your own asset. As long as that asset starts its own chain and its own ledger from scratch, nothing to worry about. We have plenty of examples of projects like projects like that, um, projects like Wow Narrow or Eon or Rio that are completely safe to use um, your, uh, because they use different keys and they have a completely different ledger. Um, but the thing we really want to talk about is what I might call a project-based chain fork. What these are, are they are typically you know, new projects with new assets, with new names. And there's a ton of different ones. You, know, you might have your Diet Monero with Lime that claims to be better. And what's unique about these is that they actually share part of the older Monero uh, ledger, the older Monero chain. But at a given time, they will basically split off from the actual Monero chain that's going off in some direction. And they'll basically start their own version of the chain. So it kind of forms a Y shape. You have the original shared chain, and then you split off there. So those are the kind of forks that we're going to talk about that are contentious and can cause problems. And just to clarify, Sring, um, with the example where they often share some of the previous existing chain and then form their own two chains in a Y shape, these are sometimes referred to as airdrops in many cases, uh, correct? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, and typically what might happen with these projects is they might ask you to go up to their wallet. They might ask you to input your Monero private keys and they'll promise you that they'll, you know, drop some of the new Diet Monero with Lime in your Diet Monero with Lime account. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I actually want to go through now, take the time to walk through some of the previous slides that I gave at DEF CON, again, uh, to talk about this sort of chain split analysis with the key image reuse, just so you can see exactly how this happens. So I'm going to share that screen right now. OK, this presentation has come in a lot of handy. <laughs> so you can see, uh, as, an, an, as an example here, uh, two different rings, one on the left, one on the right. Each ring, each green circle, uh, are two different transactions. On the left, you have chain one. Let's say that's the Monero chain. On the right, you have chain two. Let's say that is uh, Monero uh, diet with Lime, for instance. And if you wanted to make two transactions on both chains, you would ultimately spend one origin source of funds. So this one source of fund would be before the Y split. It would be generated before this Y split. And then after the split, these funds would be present on both of these chains. Uh, you can see that this yellow output here um, in this sort of pot of gold, uh, as I explained in other episodes, is the money that you actually are spending. And from each of these, you have a key image that is derived. All of these black pots are other decoys that are selected from the blockchain, so uh, from Monero's blockchain. So you can see if you start uh, sort of send two transactions on the two different chains um, incorrectly or uh, without much care, that in most cases, uh, you're, you're highly likely to choose different outputs in each. So what you would basically do is say, OK, well, here are two transactions with the same key image, but there's only one output in each set of rings that actually can be spent. Sure, there are, like, independently, uh, one of these 11 and one of these seven in this example outputs could be spent. But when you look at these two together, there's only one overlapping output that could be spent in both of these transactions. So as a result, what you can do is simply say, OK, well, I know that that's the real output spent. So both of these rings are compromised. And um, then therefore, this one output would continue on to do a further chain reaction where you would know this output is spent in this specific transaction. So it could impact other transactions too. Now, if you are able to take a, a more mitigated, uh, mitigating route like we explained earlier, instead of choosing completely different decoys or again, these black pots in both transactions, if you reuse the same exact decoys for both transactions, then you could again look for a key image match, but every single one of these outputs would be overlapping and you're no longer able to narrow down which outputs are specifically spent. So this is a really nice high level overview about what chain splits are and how you can sort of see how you're able to find, uh, how you're able to use this as an analysis tool. And from now, uh, Brandon's going to actually speak with us about what happens if you actually decide to participate in this chain split, what the risks are to users and what the mitigation methods are, if any. So it's it's funny if you're going to develop a new project uh, and you want to use Bitcoin's code, for example, you're going to copy it over. Um, and if you want people to use your project soon, you may want them to be able to claim funds from the Bitcoin blockchain on your new chain. But if you do that, you're at a big um, in Monero In Bitcoin, maybe not a big deal. But uh, in Monero, you're going to have a problem because of the diagrams that Justin just showed you. If you have a single key image and two totally disjoint key rings that overlap over only on one key, you're out of luck. Um, in fact, if you take the intersection of two rings and you only have three keys, you still have excluded all of those other keys. So um, the problem is, is that then an observer can go onto the Monero blockchain and can scratch off all of those keys that have been revealed from other rings. Uh, excuse me, the key that you spent in your in your intersected transaction, they can cross that out from other rings and that can lead to um, what's known as chain reactions. Um, but uh, although generally you don't really have to worry about it too much, uh, I'll let Aaron talk about more about that in a moment here. Um, but when you risk, uh, what are you risking exactly if you use multiple chains? If you provide a signature on two different chains from uh, the same key, uh, you're giving more information away than if you only provide one signature. It seems like a really obvious um, observation, but one of the big things that's going on right now in the data science world is that if you have two anonymized sets of data, 
uh, and you combine them, you can totally de-anonymize them. Um, so if you start spending your private information on or private keys on a different ledger, you, you're going to be risking the uh, built-in anonymity that uh, that Monero is trying to provide. Um, but actually, one of the biggest risks is the wallet software. Um, just because a development team has come out with a new uh, uh, a new project doesn't mean that they're necessarily the ones who are going to come out with a wallet for that project. And they should for safety reasons. Um, but if some third party developer comes along and comes out with some diet Monero with lime vanilla wallet, then what's going to end up happening is that you put your Monero keys into somebody, somebody random, some, some random developer's wallet. And who knows if they're emailing themselves your keys, who knows uh, the only way that you can really check is to go through line by line through their code, which is why open source is great. But it also means that in order to really safely do this, you need to know what you're doing and you need to be uh, kind of a subject matter expert. Um, so these airdrop coins are, are pretty dangerous for a variety of reasons. Um, so one way that you can mitigate this, which was described by Justin's diagram a few moments ago, is to use the same ring on both chains. If you're going to construct a ring signature, you should use both uh, the same ring in both of them. The problem with that is that, unfortunately, sometimes um, you end up with uh, um, some of the ring members from before the split and some of the ring members from after the split. And then the ones that are from after the split can be excluded, right? And you have an effectively smaller ring size. Um, so let's see here. I'm going to go through my list here and make sure that I've touched everything. Uh, yeah, so if you only use pre-fork decoys in your ring signatures, you're probably pretty good. If you make sure that you don't construct transactions for two or three days before or after the fork, you're probably pretty good. Um, and if you do what we call in the Monero world uh, churning, um, you're also pretty good. Um, although uh, churning is the practice of sending transactions to yourself over and over again. The term actually comes from anonymous communication networks. Um, but the main thing is, uh, unfortunately, for all of these mitigation methods, we don't really have strong security claims for any of them. I can't tell you to churn seven, eight, nine times and be confident that you're going to get 256 bits of, of security out of that in terms of your anonymity. Um, so even though these are mitigation methods, uh, the main thing that you can avoid doing to prevent uh, problems with chain splits is to simply not use them. Another way is to just use brand new burner keys. And every single time that you uh, need to spend money on your new chain, you make sure that you're spending it from keys that either don't exist on your other chain because you churned and sent transactions to yourself, or, or you just generate a whole new account and you just never, ever touch those funds again. Yeah. Thanks, Brandon. And one, one really important just point of uh, clarification is that when you, if you decide to, to claim funds, you should abs like in addition to just using a, a burner account for your Monero, you need to move your Monero out of that account first, or else your Monero is also at risk. Like if if someone if you have Monero in an account and they say, "Give us your Monero private key and we'll give you new coins," for instance, well, if you're giving away your Monero private key, your Monero coins are at risk. Just make sure you remember that at the bare minimum, send your Monero to a new account before giving up that private key, and make sure there's no other history associated with that account. Um, so thanks, Brandon, for covering a lot of those uh, basic mitigations that people can take. But ultimately, as you said, you really need to be a subject matter expert to cover uh, at least a very difficult use case. If you, if you really care about your privacy, you really shouldn't be touching this at all. So, um, er, uh, so uh, Sarang, can you cover what users should do if they're a bystander, they don't want to get involved in any of this chain split nonsense, they just want to stick with Monero, what ultimately can users do? What risks are they exposed to and how can they mitigate uh, their exposure? Yeah, absolutely. So as we said, there are a lot of potential pitfalls um, that can occur if you decide to participate in one of these chain splits. Um, so the safest bet is to just not participate. I do not participate, nor do I wish to participate in any. Um, but as was already hinted at, um, folks who do end up spending funds on both chains, of course, can reveal which ring member is going to be the true spender on both chains. And as was hinted at, um, we can use this in a chain reaction analysis based on being able to remove that particular spent one-time key from other rings on both chains in which they appear. So we already know how one, uh, chain reactions work. And we also know that one of the reasons that we have increasingly larger ring sizes over time is to make the effects of chain reactions less of a big deal.
if I have a, a ring of size 11 and one of those decoys happens to be part of a chain split, then I've reduced my ring size down to 10. And if this happens a lot, that is if there's very, very large participation in such a, um, a chain split, then I reduce my effective ring size more and more. And again, I haven't participated in anything. I'm just using Monero as expected, and my transactions all have rings that contain other decoys that could have participated in it. So if we're not participating, what should you do? Well, in general, because a lot of this has to do with which decoys you're choosing, the safest, you know, the safest possible thing, if you're not sure how popular a chain split's going to be and how effective a chain reaction might be against your own outputs, in general, you know, maybe if usability is not a big deal for you around that time, consider not sending any transactions on the original Monero chain for about maybe two days before and after the split. Now, the reason for this we'll talk about in our next episode has to do with the way that we select decoys in general, but that's probably the absolute safest thing that you can do. So decoys that are kind of exist in between, that, that is decoys that were created in transactions within this kind of two day range before and after, you should consider those fairly high risk decoys, as in they are at higher risk of being revealed by someone who created them and then used those in a chain split. So if you're very worried, maybe avoid usage. Again, this is not great for usability, but it's a consequence of the way that Monero transactions and double spend protection work. However, if you must use Monero in those times, and of course, if we want Monero to be usable, we have to assume that some people might need to use it in that time. Well, if that's the case, you generally are gonna to wanna to prioritize among the decoys that you choose in your transaction, decoys that occurred after the chain split. After all, if a decoy was created after the chain split, it does not exist on the other side of that Y, and therefore it cannot be spent on the other side of that Y. So post-split uh, decoys are a better option. Now, of course, again, as we're gonna talk about in the next episode, how outputs are actually selected is actually a very, very subtle topic. So this isn't necessarily a fully ideal solution, um, but it's a reasonable one if you must use Monero within kind of this two day before and after region. Um, we also talked before about a previously so-called black ball or a spent output analysis tool that, although it takes a while to run, can be used to analyze different Y forks and figure out which outputs are absolutely spent and should not be used in a, in a ring. Um, again, this is really only necessary if you're very, very worried about the popularity of a chain split. Um, as we're gonna talk about, we typically have not had much popularity with such splits, so it's not really been an issue. Um, and finally, just kind of a nice social advice is, you know, follow the community when these occur. You know, typically the community is very much on top of how popular we think such a, a chain split might be. We have a history of, of dealing with these pretty well. So if you wanna know when such a split might occur and when this two day range might happen, you know, follow the community as much as possible. Um, and of course, we have talked again about the idea of churn, which is sending funds to yourself. This is something you, you could also do um, if you have to use it during this time period. But again, churn is not something that is fully you know, understood to our satisfaction. So the absolute safest bet is to avoid that time range. And if you must use that time range, consider prioritizing outputs that were created after the split as your decoys. Excellent, thank you so much, Sarang. So I actually used that spent output tool. At the time when I ran it, it was still called the black ball tool on uh, several of these Y splits with Monero. So I ran it with Monero, with Monero version six, which was the Monero original zero classic fork, and also the Monero V fork in order to sort of determine what the actual results were, what's the real measurable impact that these forks had on individuals. And by speaking about these, we can help explain how Monero's ring signatures have provided protection and what we sort of need to do going forward. So um, I ran the tool in August 2018, and I found that 31,359 uh, rings, this is about half a percent of the rings, had reused a key image in a, a, an obvious way, so it was really obvious what output was actually spent in these rings. So you knew okay, this is the clear output, it has to be spent in this exact transaction. And as a result, this had a, a chain reaction impact that impacted eight other rings on the blockchain, which is less than a thousandth of a percent of Monero transactions. I have a quick question. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, is getting eight rings compromised when starting from 32,000 roughly, is that acceptable to you guys, in your opinion, in terms of the anonymity? Well, those numbers are very, very different. So keep in mind that this 31 or 32,000 rings, um, that, that was basically outputs that people who participated in the fork itself had affected for themselves. So to some extent, you know, again, we advise not participating 
If you participate, it is extremely likely that you would compromise your own output. You'd be one of the 32,000. The eight rings are eight entirely different rings from people who presumably did not participate in that fork. So it's not eight of 32,000, it's that 32,000 outputs basically chose to screw themselves over. And the effect of that right. was eight other outputs that were affected. That is an extremely low number. I think that any number that is not zero is you know, ideally not acceptable. However, again, this is a consequence of the fact that chain splits you know, have effects on others. It's also important to note, I'm sure Justin is, was going to mention this anyway, but let me steal the thunder for a moment, to note that, uh, that this was around the time when we were actually increasing our ring size. And remember that increasing a ring size, as we talked about before, mitigates against these effects of chain reaction. So you know, were we to have another similar scale um, chain split, now that our ring size is 11, you could expect that, that number it would I would say it's probably going to be zero, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking to the first, um, the first split I observed, that was when Monero was upgrading from ring size five to seven. So the previous chain that, that sort of continued on that other split stayed at uh, ring size five. Now we're up to ring size 11. So luckily ring signatures have a built-in buffer. They have a built-in protection against these very attacks. So um, ultimately eight, it, it, Luckily, it is a really small fraction of the total transactions, but ultimately, I also want it to be zero going forward. I don't want another chain reaction effect to happen as a result of these chain splits. So, uh, but but I'm generally confident that unless there is a, a really significant split that has a community torn in Monero, that we're unlikely to see such large chain reactions uh, going forward, luckily. So I, I hopefully this is the worst is sort of behind us, so to speak. Um, in my opinion. And uh, I guess one last thought, one last closing thought I had is that chain split um, attacks are partially social attacks. You can't just sit on your home computer and keep splitting Monero over and over, keep making more of these forks and observe information. You have to get a lot of people that are interested in Monero to really become a part of this. So um, a as a result, we can simply say, that, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, oh yeah, so these are partially social attacks. You have to get a lot of community involved. And luckily, since these are social attacks in part, they're relatively easy to observe because people need to know about this to actually claim the funds and make an impact. <laughs> so um, it's sort of a, a multi-leveled, multi-tiered attack surface here. Um, any final comments from the two of you before we sort of wrap up this episode? Well, I do have one observation. It, <laughs> this is not the only problem with the airdrop coins, right? Um, there's a variety of other security issues with them. This is the problem with airdrop coins that applies specifically to ring signature based crypto note like currencies. So um, you may be able to go find other articles describing other problems with airdrop coins that are beyond the scope of this discussion. Um, and I guess the only thing that I would really close on is, you know, like so many other things that affect, you know, personal, financial, digital security, um, it's very, very subtle. Um, and in general, you know, I kind of, you know, kind of take on the mantra that if I am not extremely confident in how to do such a thing correctly, the best thing to do is just to not do it. So, you know, we've already talked about how very subtle it is to participate in these chain splits. If you're not extremely confident that you know exactly how to do it correctly to protect yourself, you really shouldn't do it. Um, and as we know, there are very simple mitigations you can do if you are not participating um, that can mitigate, mitigate against the effects of others. All right. Thank you so much, Sarang and Brandon. We're happy to have both of you on again in this episode. Again, the next episode is specifically on the Monero input selection algorithm and how this has consequences of everything to do with ring signatures. It's a really big topic that we have in the next episode. Uh, so hopefully this chain split episode is really helpful for you. It is one of the really unique parts about Monero and consequences about how Monero prevents double spending. And there's ways to mitigate it, but it's important to sort of communicate exactly what the consequences and impacts are to the rest of the community. So hopefully this has been really helpful to everyone here. And um, we're going to, uh, sorry. Yeah, and so uh, with that, I'm just going to wrap up the episode. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. See you in the next one. Thank you yeah. so much.